discuss the ABCs of neuropathy. But first, I want to go over a few disclaimers. The following information is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any specific diseases or medical conditions. Please consult a licensed healthcare practitioner before beginning any natural, conventional, or functional medicine treatments or protocols. By using this site, you understand and agree nothing here is to be construed as personal medical treatment advice and is not a substitute for professional medical care. The FDA has not approved or evaluated the information on this site. Financial disclosures. I wrote a book called Feet Don't Fail Me Now. I wrote it approximately five years ago. It needs to be updated. Um, and then I do consult nationally and internationally on chronic health issues including neuropathy. My intention for this video is for educational purposes only for the participants in the neuropathy pain support group. People often ask what is peripheral neuropathy, what causes it, and what can be done to restore the peripheral nerves to health. Hopefully this following presentation will answer some of these questions. So this is a picture of a nerve and some of you have had issues with um, conduction or compression. So basically the axon is what allows communication of the nerves to go from one neuron to the next. The myelin sheath is the layer outside the nerve which can be affected. So on your left hand side you can see what a normal nerve looks like. Some people have what they call focal compression and this can be caused by trauma, it could be caused by repetitive stress, sometimes we can have compression due to um, post-surgical problems, and these are more your focal mononeuropathy type issues. If we do have sheath loss, this is the myelin sheath, the line of the nerve, the myelin once it does deteriorate or degenerate, it does not grow back. Then you have issues where the nerve just does not communicate properly from one nerve to the next, so you get mixed signals and probably the most common is just degeneration which is a normal process of aging but I do believe that it can be um, minimized and sometimes changed a little bit if this is the issue. So per peripheral neuropathy is extremely common. It's estimated right now that about 20 million Americans suffer from this and I actually believe this estimate is low because a lot of people that have it just don't go see their doctor, they just live with it. So, in essence, it's when the electric wiring from the brain does not communicate properly to the hands, feet, or sometimes the different organs in our body. So, by definition, peripheral means out from the center of the body, so away from the brain and sp spinal cord. Neuro means nerves, and pathy means abnormal, so it's abnormal nerve flow away from the brain and sp spinal cord. The major signs of neuropathy, and you can have some of these, all of these, one of these, can be numbness, burning feet, cramping, sharp electric pain, pain when walking, difficulty sleeping from leg discomfort, tingling feelings, loss of balance, weakness, and swelling. These are the most common signs, and there are other things that can happen also. So oftentimes people are like, they've heard words like small fiber neuropathy, large fiber neuropathy. So let me just describe what that means a little bit. So small fibers, which will cause a small fiber neuropathy, are, come from nerves that are called C fibers. These mainly deal with pain and temperature. So you're, if you're having more issues with pain, and are burning or cold, these are more the C fibers that are affected, so it's a small fiber neuropathy. The large fibers, which are sometimes called the large diameter afferents, deal with vibration and proprioception. So if you find yourself losing your balance, maybe have a vibration sense, you're bumping into things a little bit more, more commonly these are your large diameter afferent fibers that are affected. Now some people can have a combination of both and oftentimes with a degenerative type neuropathy, both nerve fibers are affected. 
So this is just a, what the nerves actually look like. So the A fibers are their large fibers on your left hand side. Your C fibers are your small fibers that deal with the small fiber neuropathy and pain and temperature. This is just a little chart that just kind of goes over again, basically the small fiber neuropathy and large fiber. And so on the left hand side, with small fiber, you're going to get loss of pain and temperature, but touch vibration and pressure will be normal. Reflexes are usually good and motor function is usually good. Um, this will create some autonomic issues, so problems with different organs in your body or blood vessels, so circulation, sometimes bladder issues, and it could, be a, it could affect a lot of the different organs. Um, normally when they do studies like EMGs and nerve conduction studies, they're normal. However, well, the skin biopsy test will actually show that there is a small fiber neuropathy issue. On the other side, the large fiber neuropathy, that affects the touch and vibration, and it will affect something called position sense. So you'll get um, more loss of balance. So I put down here sensory at ataxia, which basically means um, your body sometimes just doesn't know where it is in space. So when you touch, you don't really feel your feet so well or you're bumping into things. Um, with large fiber, the pain and temperature pathways are preserved, so there's no issue there unless you have a combined of the two, small and large fiber. And then when they do the electrodiagnostic testing, you will have a positive nerve conduction velocity test, which affecting whatever nerve you know that is affected from the neuropathy. So symptoms are dependent on what actual nerve is affected. We have different nerves in our body. We have sensory nerves, which carry sensation, motor nerves, which control muscles, and then we have autonomic nerves, which actually carry information to the blood vessels. So if your sensory fibers are affected, it's going to create things like tingling, numbness, um, sometimes again, balance issues, the sensory ataxia that I mentioned. And usually, um, for a lot of neuropathies, sensation changes often begin at the feet and then will progress towards the center of the body as the condition worsens. So, you know, many of you know that the neuropathy is a progressive degenerative condition. And so through time, you're going to get other symptoms spreading throughout the body. Motor involvement will affect, you know, more movement issues. So you can have cramping, you can have weakness, you can have um, difficulty like grabbing things, holding on to things, so more dexterity issues, and sometimes you'll even lose uh, muscle bulk. Now, when I, I think this is one of the most important slides of the whole lecture, and basically, what it basically says is any condition on that left hand side, for it to become an issue, you have to have some metabolic imbalance as well as a neurological imbalance. So conditions, and it could be a little bit different for everybody, what that condition is that creates that neuropathy. So it could be anemia, chronic inflammation. We are all well aware of the diabetes and the blood sugar issues. But it could be other things like autoimmunity, sometimes hidden gut infections. Uh, low oxygen, so hypoxia, anemia, these all can create peripheral neuropathy and in turn it will decrease the frequency of firing of the brain and the nervous system creating fatigue and then degeneration of the brain. So unless these metabolic issues and or neurological issues or imbalances are addressed, the neuropathy is going to continue to progress. If you can find what that hidden cause is, then I think that the progression of this can be decreased and not really resolved because they say there is no cure, but I have seen symptoms improve greatly by figuring out what the metabolic and or neurological imbalance is and then fixing that. So through other lectures that I'm going to give, I'm going to talk about certain conditions and things that I have found to support the neuropathy to help it improve or at least make sure that it doesn't progress. So in my office what I found is it's a combination of issues. So it could be 60% neurologic, 40% metabolic. The next person that comes in that I evaluate could be 80% metabolic, 20% neurologic. 
it all depends on the testing um, and the type of neuropathy that actually presents. So in one of my lectures soon, I'm going to go over probably this coming week, um, how I evaluate a patient. So the test that I run to look for small and nerve fiber neuropathy besides the electrodiagnostics or the skin biopsy that you have um, possibly done through your neurologist. So what it comes down to is basically, you know, the, the basic ingredients. We have to eat food. Our body needs to break this down, which means we have to have good absorption. And when we don't have good absorption, or if we're, our body doesn't know how to break down proteins, fats, or carbohydrates properly, or if we're not eating the proper foods, we're going to have troubles converting that to energy. So energy is basically our fuel. So it's the glucose. And our most, um, our most, um, our most of our energy goes to the nervous system. So 30% of all our energy goes to the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. So we need good metabolism to produce energy to have a well-functioning brain and nerve. So that's why I stress dietary changes so much. If you're not doing that most fundamental step, in my opinion, you're going to see no improvement of your symptoms. So these are not in any particular order, but these are the some of the causes of neuropathy. So some of you are well aware that statin drugs can create neuropathy. Back issues like arthritis, spinal stenosis, or bulging disc can create neuropathy. Post-surgical issues can lead to scar tissue, which can lead to neuropathy. Diabetes is the most common type of neuropathy. And, um, and then chronic inflammation. So most people don't talk about this part. It's, it's what I see almost, like I said, it's the underlying cause that creates some of these issues. So basic things, food sensitivities, in, um, restricting your inflammatory foods, or if you eat inflammatory foods, it's gonna help create more nerve in, irritation and imbalances. Sometimes we have these hidden gut infections. So there is a huge gut-brain connection. And in part, it's why when you go to your neurologist, he's going to concentrate on your nervous system. He's not going to look at underlying infections in your gut that might be causing these, this level of inflammation in your body. Chemotherapy is another cause, chemo-induced neuropathy. There can be genetic or autoimmune issues like charcoal marie tooth. And then idiopathic neuropathy. So they say this accounts for about 30% of all neuropathies. I, and when I see this, what I look for in the body is toxins, infections, autoimmune issues, sometimes nutritional deficiencies, chronic liver and kidney disease. I look for other causes of what created that neuropathy, not, I just don't settle for the idiopathic. I'm also not big on labels. So when people come into my office, they have these diagnosis that what I try to do is break down what the cause is, what the best way to support the body to help to eliminate that cause, and what I've seen is symptoms start to improve and sometimes nerves can heal. So we talked about the statin drug. So I just want to go over why this is an issue because what statins do is they inhibit the formation of cholesterol. In functional medicine, which that's the type of practitioner that I am, it's we like cholesterol no lower than 150. So cholesterol's kind of gotten a bad rap through the years, and but it's super important for our brain and our nerves. It's the fat that kind of makes up that sheath of the nerve, that myelin. So when people have cholesterol below 150, which some doctors really like it that low, what I think is this is um, creating not enough insulation, not really good for the brain and or the nerves. The other thing statins do is they inhibit the formation of CoQ10. So CoQ10 is an antioxidant. It's super important for a part of our cell that creates the energy. It's called the mitochondria. And a lot of the imbalances that occur in these nerves and or metabolic issues are really mitochondrial issues that occur at the cell level. So statin drugs is a 
one of the leading causes of peripheral neuropathy. If you are on a statin drug, I you know, suggest you continue to take it, obviously, but it's not a bad idea to supplement yourself with CoQ10, either 100 or 200 milligrams. So you're actually getting that CoQ10 back in your body so um, the mitochondria can be healthy. We talked about lower back issues, so stenosis, which is a narrowing of the canal. So it's, it's more, stenosis caused, or one of the symptoms of stenosis is you get more pain walking or standing and relief with sitting. Bulging disc is kind of the opposite. It's more pain when you sit and you can have it while you're walking also. And then degenerative arthritis can be another cause of neuropathy. So it, you can see that the nerves that go from the lower back, they go all the way down to the feet. So the sciatica is the big nerve that most of us are, are um, familiar with. And so if you are getting compression of that nerve, part of the treatment, obviously, is to decompress that spine. So one of the things that we do in our office, we do a spinal decompression protocol for some of our neuropathy patients if we believe that part of their issue is um, caused from their, their spine. And even though I am a chiropractor, I honestly don't see too much neuropathy caused from lower back issues. And diabetes, as I mentioned, is the most common type of neuropathy. Um, our nerves need energy to survive, and glucose is the number one source of energy for the nerve. So what basically happens is we eat food, the insulin is supposed to take that food, which is converted to energy, and bring it into the cell. So if you have insulin resistance where the cell says no to that insulin, bring it into the cell, then what will happen is you'll get more glucose throughout the cell and not or throughout the body and not quite into the cell. So it's going to create this hyperglycemia diabetic issue, which eventually will create um, inflammatory condition of the nerves and the nerves will become fatigued, eventually degenerate, and you will have symptoms like numbness, burning, pain, weakness, or tingling. In my office, probably the most important thing that I address is inflammation. So if the body is inflamed, it just isn't going to get better. So, you know, I kind of say if you can't, you can't build a house if it's on fire. So, and it's the same thing with neuropathy. You can't support the body if you have a level of inflammation that you're not willing to address and you're looking for that magic bullet that's going to take that pain away. It won't really go away if your body's still inflamed. So you have to look to see where that source of inflammation is coming from. So some cause of inflammation that really most people or most I would say physicians don't really address that I find to be extremely prevalent are your food sensitivities, certain inflammatory foods, and you can hear the testimonials from some of the members of the board that when they've gone to more of an anti-inflammatory diet, their body is starting to heal and their pain level gets reduced. Now, my first 25 years of practice, I didn't know this. It probably took me the last 10 years to realize how important this is and what an impact it has on the body. And, and pain in general. So we look for hidden gut infections, um, high insulin, obviously, um, basic things like high blood sugar, sometimes hormone imbalances. These can create inflammation of the body, and there's actually a lot of different causes. So that's the importance of good blood work in the beginning, a nice um, complete metabolic panel and CBC, um, other markers to look at anemia and homocysteine, so we like to look at, you know, the two main things I think is the body needs fuel and activation. So it needs glucose anemia or glucose, glucose and oxygen. So you can't have diabetes and or anemia. Otherwise, the nerves just aren't going to heal. Your kidney and liver have to be functioned properly. You have to have good B12 levels and you need to check your homocysteine levels. So if your homocysteines are too high, it will start to destroy not only cardiovascular tissue, but it will also destroy nerves. And it's a marker that sometimes docs don't check that I always like to check my homocysteine levels and CRP on a patient. So what, what does a nerve need to revive and repair? 
So the, the, it needs fuel. So fuel can be glucose and oxygen. Proper glucose levels in the functional medicine world is 85 to 99. So if you're above 100, let's say 100 to 125, you're in that insulin resistant range. And above 115, 125, you're looking now in the diabetic range. You have to get your numbers down and get your A1C, your hemoglobin A1C, HbA1C down to ideally around 5.7, 5.6. Anything above, above 6.5, you're going to have issues healing. The other thing is you have to reduce the inflammation and have good neurotransmitters. And then if you have the good fuel, then you need activation. So activation is essentially exercise. So different nerves need to be able to exercise, which will help not only insulin resistant issues, but it helps to rebuild pathways. So what we do is when we evaluate a patient, we determine where that ner nerve issue is or that neuropathy is, and then we try to give activation to that specific nerve, to that specific part of the brain to help rebuild that pathway. In our office, and you know, you've probably been to different practitioners that utilize different modalities, and sometimes they've worked for you and sometimes they haven't. What I'm going to say is when you do everything together, you're going to have better results. So if you just go to an office and they put on, let's say, anodyne therapy or some cold laser and they don't handle that metabolic side creating an inflammation, your results, if you're going to have any benefit, is going to be short-lived. You need to approach it not only from stimulating the nerves, but you have to handle that inflammatory metabolic side as well. So things we use in our office, we use an infrared for circulation if the issue is a circulatory issue. We use different stimulation. I have three different types of stimulation that I use in my office. Uh, we also use cold laser. Now cold laser by itself, again, in my opinion, is not going to be successful unless combined with other treatments. So oftentimes with a patient, we will utilize one, two, or all three of these dependent on uh, what type of neuropathy they have. And then, then you need to have overall support. So there's things that people recommend, different protocols, and there is a foundational protocol that I will get to that I think that to have a nerve heal, you have to have these certain ingredients in your body. Um, they're not always all necessary, but there is a foundation that must be, must be addressed because if you don't have that foundation, again, the nerve just is not gonna heal. And each individual is going to be different. Um, that's why programs that recommend just one protocol is never going to work. So, you know, I've seen a lot of comments on pay, um, people saying that, um, oh, I tried that and that didn't work. And the truth is, it won't work. You, there is no magic bullet. There is no single product that is ever going to work that's going to take away your neuropathy for a long period of time unless you addressed the fundamental support, which can be nutritional and dietary. You support the activation part, so you get, do different exercise to build the nerves back up. And then you handle the metabolic side to um, take care of that inflammatory component. So it needs to be the whole thing combined. And most doctors aren't equipped enough to handle this. That's why you get so frustrated when you go to the doctor and he doesn't listen to you. Now, a few, a few have found great doctors, and I'm super excited for that because it's getting more and more um, common I, that you know, people realize what a problem this is. They're becoming more educated on how to, how to help this. So some key points. It takes many things to correct peripheral neuropathy. I should say support. Not just one thing will do it. As I said, there is no magic bullet. You have to address the metabolic and neurological problem to have success. And the condition is progressive. If you only do one thing, it's going to con continue to progress. So when you start on a medication like gabapentin, and all of a sudden the symptoms start getting worse, and they change your medication, and they keep up in the dose, it's because you haven't decided to take control yourself and do those other components. So I've kind of touched upon this why it is so difficult to diagnose and support, because all doctors have their specialty. You go to the neurologist 
and he specialized in nerves. And if you have a issue, let's say chemical toxicity, or let's say it is a gut infection, or um, some even autoimmunity, is he going to find the cause to that, or is he just going to prescribe some medication and tell you, you know, do an electrodiagnostic study, give you a great label, and tell you you have small nerve fiber or large nerve fiber neuropathy? Then what really is the treatment? How is it going to get better with gabapentin Lyrica? Now, I do know that for many people, this helps reduce their, reduce their symptoms, and I'm fully supportive of that if that's what you need to take to reduce your symptoms. What I'm suggesting is if you look for the underlying cause, treat it metabolically, neurologically, as well as from a foundational dietary and supplemental aspect, I think that you can reduce those pain levels. I see it on a daily basis.